Good morning, everyone. It is so good to see you all today. I want to say happy birthday, Harry Potter. I am wearing my Deathly Hallows, for those who know. And as we are turning to our scripture lesson, would you please pray with me? Holy God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Still any voice within us but your own. Give us ears to hear you, eyes to see you, hearts that are open to feeling your presence as you move and live and breathe in our midst. And now may the words of our mouths and the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So for our scripture lesson today, I want to take a moment and tell you a little bit about our first scripture lesson, just because it is so important to what we are talking about. Today in worship, we talked about Esther, and Esther is one of those really important books in the Bible that we don't get to spend nearly enough time talking about. Esther is a story that happens when the children of God are in exile abroad in a number of countries, but this story happens locally to the children that are in the Persian Empire. Under King Ahasuerus is how he is called in the book, but we know from scholars that is actually King Xerxes I. It is the story of a young Jewish girl named Hadassah, who her Persian name is actually Esther. So the story begins, Xerxes holds a massive feast that lasts for days, probably weeks, and he calls for his wife at his advisor's request uh, into the feast when the men have already been drinking for a very long time, and the queen refuses to come, Queen Vashti, and when she refuses to come, he realizes that this is a threat to his authority, so he divorces her which means it's time for a new queen. And a decree is set out to all the land. He has to find a new wife, and though many maidens are brought before him, he ends up falling madly in love with Esther. And she becomes queen. But in the meantime, a man named Haman, who has been working in King Xerxes' court, gets into a fight with a Jewish man named Mordecai. Now, ironically enough, Mordecai is a relative of Esther's, and Haman, because he's so upset at Mordecai, decides to kill all the Jewish people. A little bit of an overreaction. But Mordecai writes to Esther and says, Esther, you need to help us. And that is where we picked up our story. Mordecai calls to Esther and says, you are in a position to do something, and you have to. And finally, Esther relents, and she goes, and she does end up seeing the king and saving her people. It is an important story, and one I want you to keep in the back of your mind about what we can do wherever we are. So, our main scripture passage for today, we are still in our summer sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit. Therefore, we are in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have a confession to make. Back when I was in middle and high school, I had a serious crush, like over-the-moon crush on one boy. Ooh, I had it bad. He was an actor and was in these coming-of-age stories about high school and college that I loved. And eventually he was in these creature features that I still watch to this day. I would go to the theater every time I could to see him, and then I would go to Blockbuster on Friday nights to rent his movies as soon as they came out and I would buy them if I could. I just lived for his adorable smile. Okay, I'm gonna say his name. Brendan Fraser. So skip ahead to a lot of years later, and I come to find out I was not alone. In fact, there is an entire generation of us that were in love with him. 
because he not only played these characters, but he actually is the quintessential good guy. Genuinely, he is kind and humble to a level where he doesn't even realize most of the time how big a following he has. For years, he suffered from depression and anxiety from abuse that he received in Hollywood until one day he found out and was brought to tears by people finally telling him how big an impact the roles that he has played over the years have had upon our lives. So one of my favorite roles that he was ever in is from one of his first movies, and I've talked about it before. The movie is entitled School Ties, and it starred just about every young heartthrob from the early 90s every single one. Frazier played a young football player named David Green, who was brought in on scholarship to a prep school in the Northeast so that they could win a championship. Unbeknownst to almost everyone, David was Jewish. Now, this is a big deal, and later on in the movie, it becomes a source of great consternation and drama. But early on, Almost no one knows, and David has to miss the holy day of Rosh Hashanah because of a football game, which were all played on Saturdays because back in the 50s, they didn't have all those pretty little overhead lights that we have now. Later that night, after the game is won, the headmaster finds Frazier's character David praying in Hebrew in the school chapel after lights out, doing his best to make up for not getting to synagogue on that important festival day. The two have a conversation before he is sent back to bed, and discussing how he gave up the game, the headmaster makes the comment, you people are very determined, aren't you? David responds, knowing that the scholarship he has depends on his performance in all things and his diplomacy. Sometimes we have to be. The headmaster then brings up The Beatitudes, I'm reminded of a blessing. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And David answers, I wonder how meek they will be when they do. My friends, we are down to our last three fruits of the Spirit. And today's fruit is a particular pickle, as my children would say. Gentleness, proud taste often translated as meekness. And like the headmaster in the movie, this fruit has been badly abused throughout the history of the church to keep the meek in their place. The poor, the women, the outcasts, the abused, the lost, the forsaken, the children, the oppressed, all those people that if they were to ever rise up and expect their seat at the table, well, they would cause quite a kerfuffle now, wouldn't they? I had to do some serious research on this word because I found myself in quite the quandary right away. You see, every other fruit of the Spirit has a direct cognate in biblical Hebrew, a word that is laced throughout the Hebrew Bible, something that is tied directly to God's character. Remember, we've seen this through the entire series. For peace, it was shalom. For kindness, it was hesed. For faithfulness, it was aman. But when I began this week and went to look for a word for gentleness, well, there wasn't one. And there definitely was not a word for meekness. So I started thinking, our all-powerful God is anything but meek. When God moves, we know it. As to gentleness, well, I dug deeper. According to Strong's lexicon, this word, prautes, can also mean expressing power with reserve. That does certainly describe our God. Love is always giving space for the other to move. There's a willingness to listen carefully and to be vulnerable with the other whom they love. And that certainly describes our God and the relationships our God desires for us. Then I also went to my lexicon from Divinity School, the Bauer Danker lexicon, and there I found that this word can mean humility. Hmm, now that one does actually have a Hebrew cognate, tisana, 
Unlike the other fruit, though, this one is not used that often. And it is never, ever said about God. It is always said about us, especially about what the children of God are meant to do in our relationship to God. But what happens far more often in the Hebrew Bible is that words like pride, arrogance, haughtiness are used. Words describing how the people of God are stiff-necked when it comes to what we're meant to do in following God. And those are the opposite of tisana and praotes. The truth is that the Hebrew Bible is full of stories of how God chooses to be the God of the meek ones, the little ones, as Jesus called them. And time after time, the world, especially God's people, arrogantly and haughtily, stiff-neckedly and hard-heartedly choose to ignore them. Or worse, they choose to abuse them, to steal from them in small and large ways, to oppress them, and yes, to put them in their place. So several years ago, I heard a dear friend and colleague preach a sermon on this particular fruit of the Spirit. While I do not remember everything she said that day, what I do know is that she heard what I hear in this word. That in addition to remembering to walk humbly before our God, this fruit of the Spirit pushes us to act with reserve when others cause us harm. More specifically, we are pushed to choose action in the face of all the abuses and robbery and oppression and subjugation and so many other things that still happen in our midst. Standing with those who are getting hurt even if it puts ourselves in jeopardy. The other passage that we read in church this morning is about my favorite biblical heroine, Esther. You know, because she's a woman, she is so often underestimated, and she was expected to act a certain way. Yet her relative Mordecai, he knew that God acts through all of us wherever we are, in whatever time, and in whatever place. Perhaps you have come to where you are for just such a time as this. Use it. A book of confessions, which I've been teaching to our officers of late, is full of documents from the last century that did the same, where children of God chose to stand and speak because of something very wrong in their midst. Whether it was Belhar that was addressing the churches in South Africa that upheld apartheid in God's house, or the Confession of 1967 that was written by the Southern Presbyterian Church to address the many ways that the church had been complicit in injustice and therefore should be a part of the solution or the Declaration of Barman, where people actually lost their lives for signing and standing against the Third Reich. Those people, in our recent history, they also chose to use action in the face of all that was against God's purposes in this world. Because here's the truth. God has always stood especially with the oppressed and with the orphan, the widow, the foreigner, the prisoner, the sick, the outcast, the downtrodden, the refugee, the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the lost, the women, the children, the poor, the afflicted. In a word, the meek. And while we are meant to live with humility, to acknowledge our brokenness and our sinfulness in this very fallen world. We are also meant to realize that we are to follow the path of love that Christ laid before us, using the strength and power that we have in reserve to stand with all of those that God has chosen to fight for throughout all of eternity.
And then, when we do that, we break out of our stiff-necked ways and empower the world into a bright new future. It's what my children would call a sort of power-up, like a superhero. Yes, I'm saying it, you get to be superheroes too. But only if you are brave enough to choose to stand with reserved strength in the face of all that will hurt those who God loves. And that's everyone, and especially the meek. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.